it gives me great pleasure to introduce the uh, the next sponsor on the next panel. Um, <laughs> it's a, a familiar brand because <laughs> it feels some. Well, anyway, I shall just stand up and highlight that. But uh, you might sponsor. <laughs> Mark's laughing. Let me just cue in Adrian. Adrian, are you out there? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? And I'm going to just bring up the slide, and off you go. Hey, thank you very much, Tom. So uh, Ideas is a software company that uh, builds large-scale media workflows uh, for major enterprises and CDNs. Uh, we specialize in live video and low latency delivered at scale. Uh, our core focus is on high availability and delivering real world high availability, which we think is very different to doing the same in a lab or controlled environment. In the real world, things that you can't predict, you know, happen, infrastructures, unreliable sources of questionable quality, etc. And it's how we perform under those challenging circumstances that we feel is most relevant to our customers, some of whom have been up for seven plus years without a live support call. Now, that's not because nothing's ever gone wrong. It's because at scale, inevitably, things will go wrong. Servers will die, networks will fail, etc. But because the systems have healed themselves before anybody could notice. Our solutions are typically built with ideas uh, own media libraries and very little third party code, which gives us very fine grained control and flexibility. This allowed one of our customers, Arkiva, to go in six weeks from a service that was working on 16% of target devices to one that worked on 96%. Another scaled the number of multi-language live sporting events that they could offer uh, commentary on by an order of magnitude by making very early and aggressive use of WebRTC. The same control allowed us to, <clears throat> a new, to deliver a new low latency uh, platform into a CDN uh, who's been in this show um, uh, that delivered 10 to 15 times the throughput that they used to have on their old platform on exactly the same hardware. With all that focus on high availability, however, throughout, that's the sort of key for us. Um, so to wrap up, are we continuing to focus and innovate at the forefront of the technical curve? So there's been a lot of discussion about low latency HLS um, in, in some of the previous uh, uh, panels. And in particular, yeah, we think that's a very, very hot area. And RFC um, 8673 within that is extremely important that, you know, with the benefits that that enables um, to uh, control the amount of data that you actually need to, to push and manage and so on and so forth. And we have live technology demonstrators with some of the speakers who were on earlier um, as part of that. So um, yeah, do reach out uh, if high scale, highly tailored solutions um, of this nature might be of interest, um, especially if you want one that is highly, um, you know, has high availability at its core. Thank you very much. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Adrian, just for, for the record for everybody, uh, what is your role within Ideas? Just for uh, everybody to I'm, know. Uh, probably the chief CEO. We don't really do titles, but yeah, I'm one of the founders. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. I make Dom's um, coffee. I also have, uh, That's mainly it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I also invite one of people, Guillaume and Brett. Uh, Guillaume, can you tell a little bit about yourself and what you do within uh, Varnish? Of course. Um, so I'm a solution engineer. I'm also a core developer. Um, but yeah, basically everything in technical. Um, and the technical side. <laughs> yes. I mean, Perfect. making sure that uh, what we develop can also be deployed at scale. And so I'm basically the guy who get blamed for everything <laughs> if something goes wrong. So I try. Wrong position. Um, well, I just make sure that everything goes right. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Problem solved, exactly. Okay. Brett. Hello. Uh, I'm a product manager. I work for uh, Quilt. Uh, I, I'm relatively new to Quilt. I've just been uh, with them for uh, about five months now. Uh, and before Quilt, I've worked as product manager across the CDN space. So I've been in product management for about the past 10 years. And... Uh, uh, in the CDN space for that time. Uh, before that, I worked uh, across uh, operations for streaming video delivery companies, OVPs, uh, in that uh, sort of space. I've been around the uh, uh, streaming space for probably longer than I'd like to admit to. Uh, my first events that were at scale, which were uh, often disasters, were WCW wrestling events back in the 1990s, 98, 99 in there. Uh, and we would have, uh, you know, 50 to 100,000 viewers uh, at that point. Uh, they would actually just be listening to audio streams. Uh, but I've been around this for a while and uh, 
I've, I've got the lumps on my head to, to show that uh, it doesn't always go well. But uh, so lessons learned, right? How it works. I, I hope. <laughs> I'm starting to get old enough that I'm not sure I can learn anymore. <laughs> But, but, oh, but as a product yeah. manager, as a product manager now, mostly I just go to meetings. I don't really uh, do stuff anymore. No, you can blame other people, right? Yeah, like that's, the whole, that's the whole job. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, first question I have here is um, a lot of companies really don't have a clue about what comes into play when you want to manage, uh, orchestrate, uh, and operate a CDN infrastructure. Um, I know you guys have all kinds of different backgrounds uh, on it uh, and different perceptions on, on how it exactly works. So could you give all, let, let's start with, uh, let's start with Brad. Um, can you all give one, one, ex one important thing you think is important for orchestrating and operations in terms of CDN infrastructure? That's key. So I think the, uh, the, if I'm just gonna to make one point about it, I think that the, um, there's really sort of across networks and service providers, there's a, a lack of uh, uh, standards when it comes to working at a global level. And I think uh, content owners like uh, Disney, actually, who had many people on the previous panel, coming in and really uh, pushing open standards uh, will help straighten that out over time. Uh, I think it takes those folks uh, working at scale to, to push the CDNs uh, into a, a spot where it uh, makes it a little bit easier to uh, manage and orchestrate uh, across that. Standardization is basically more standards on the, on the CDN side, basically. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, I think it's going to benefit all of us over time. Okay. Good. Uh, Guillaume, um, as building your own, you, you have your own cash. So, how do you cope with this kind of, okay, what is your unique thing? Is that this really is really important in, in operating an organization? So, we, we take the approach the other way around. Basically, we have all those little building blocks and we either build something out of them or we use them to integrate with what already exists. So, I, and I definitely think that standardization is really going to help everyone. So I'm not going to fight <laughs> here. Um, but yeah, we are more on the side of, you know what? There are off the shelf solutions that are going to exist if you want to tailor them to your needs, whether cost, performance, uh, maybe location, then you can, you can expand. So our approach here is not necessarily going to be standardization, although that's going to be useful, but more modularity and, and being able to plug all those different elements. Um, yes, so cohesion that. between the cohesion of all the different elements that are there, basically. Yes, so I guess, in a sense, that's standardiz standardization, but at the micro level, rather than the, the macro. So same idea as just different mm -hmm. scope, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly why I want to have the different views of the thing. Uh, Adrian, uh, based on our experience on uh, the forefront, uh, what's your experience, especially if you look at light, what's your experience on this? I, I think there's probably two aspects to it. One is, and I, I agree with 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 with, with Guillaume, our experience is typically that we're building into a, a you know, an enterprise CDN or a, a, a large customer of some sort. So it's typically we'll make it fit their environment. But but being able to deliver you know real transparency and observability. Um, I, I think is absolutely key because when you have systems running thousands or tens of thousands of servers that scale up and scale down and so on, you, you have to give this illusion of simplicity. And then you need to be able to go from some kind of 10,000 foot view of my world is happy through to, oh, okay, this contributor over here is trying to do a WebRTC stream, but they're sending us B frames that the client doesn't present and I need to be able to go from my universe is happy to here's how I fix this very specific problem for this very specific um, customer really quickly and unless you can get on top of stuff like that then as you scale and the number of customers goes up and up and up and up um, yeah if you're having to troubleshoot all of those all of the time that becomes challenging and crash down at some point yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> good uh, I mean if, if you if you look take a step back right uh, I see a trend if I look, look been in the industry for a while. I see trends of let's I, I call it building blocks. So there are more and more building blocks out there that are basically getting more and more standardized, or at least in some degree. Yep. Um, 
So can we say that the differentiation in the future is more amongst, okay, what building blocks you are using for what specific situation? And that is more important than the actual building blocks itself. Is that where the future is going in that regard? Um, that's interesting in as much as I, I think innovation tends to be driven by new capability or new lines of business that frankly are opening up for the, for the customers because that's what opens checkbooks. Uh, and so it's the ability to say, uh, okay, I can open up a, you know, a line of business where I, I'm providing multilingual commentary or something and I can do that really quickly and I don't have to invest infrastructure and so on. And I, I think one of the challenges that will happen, and I think this is a long-term thing. I think this is you know 10, 20 years, yeah. not 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 five, you know, two, three years, is that CDNs are sort of split into to two modes. And they, most CDNs provide but you know both of these modes. One is a core business which is based around HTTP caching and efficient distribution of, of, of objects like that. And then with the emergence of kind of edge compute and um Things like WebRTC, which are, 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 are session oriented. Um, actually, WebRTC kind of looks much more like a, uh, an edge compute challenge than a traditional CDN, um, uh, you know, uh, HTTP cache type, type behavior. And I think those two models will start to merge, both from a technical perspective with things like Quick coming along, but also, you know, I want to be able to say, okay, this machine is currently being an HTTP cache, but it's it's a bit, it's not very, um, it's not very busy right now. So I'm going to change its purpose and and you know uh, uh, move it to some other kind of function. So I think those two will kind of merge, and the ability to do that is absolutely based around small bits of functionality that I can inject into a running system, or I can take, you know, clients that are on this particular system and aggregate them all over to some other server in a way that they don't know. Uh, yeah, you haven't haven't realized happened has happened and so on, and uh, it's 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 again that kind of illusion of of uh, continuity and uniformness when actually you, you you've got a very dynamic situation going on under the covers. Okay, um, Guillaume, uh, back to you. Uh, your software, right? Varnish is software based. Um, mm -hmm. So you basically are independent. Let's say in terms of infrastructure. Right, so what kind of infrastructure basically it doesn't really matter that much, and this is in line with what uh, Jason thought is okay. The future, everything is just resources, and then on top of software, um, is that also how you approach it from a, a varnish perspective in terms of how you look at it? Even even though it's software and uh, you couple the decouple infrastructure with what you actually have in functionality on the other side. So, yes and no, of course. Did I mention I'm a software engineer? Um, <laughs> so, we can run anywhere. Um, containers, VMs, bare metal. It doesn't matter um, to us as software. To you, it's probably going to matter because if that software is running where your users cannot access it or not fast enough, or the, it cannot reach the origin, it's going to matter um, quite a lot. And I, I think that's the, the important part here. Varnish being able to run everywhere basically removes a variable from the, from the equation. And that's that whole yeah, building blocks um, approach that you were talking about. The problem is if you grab a off-the-shelf solution, it's probably going to have a set of parameters and you cannot change that many of them. So basically saying, hey, we are software, we are putting some, some agency on you saying, hey, you decide where uh, that, that should run. But by doing so, basically we remove ourselves from the equation and we don't impose any requirements on them. And I, I think that's very important because CDNs are all going to continue to diversify themselves to try to create um, added value. And some are going to go with video, some are going to go with API calls, some are specializing on locations, security, and so on and so forth. So here, basically, we're just saying, hey, we have something that's going to work everywhere. 
in pretty much any cases, video, um, all that. So you decide the network, you decide that. And I do realize that yeah, we don't want to take that responsibility, but that's also giving a lot more freedom to our customers. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty important point here uh, regarding versatility because we don't know where the future is going to take us. And no. I think uh, the point about WebRTC and, and HTTP is probably a pretty good one. We don't know. <laughs> so let's be ready for it. So in the space of we don't know, I think an interesting piece of that is, uh, is the moving out to the edge that Adrian was talking about, and not the moving out to the edge, but the fungibility of the edge and being able to take your edge and change it from one thing to another, whether it's a, a varnish or an open cache, uh, that's going in there or WebRTC. It's very difficult to take and get an edge uh, installed really at the edge of the internet when you're going all the way out into the service provider's network and getting that equipment installed. And once it's there, it's more difficult to change it <laughs> than it was to get it in the first place because you have to get people interested in making changes that uh, work in, in large organizations that move uh, uh, very slowly. So I think over, over time, uh, we're going to find that there's a lot of magic in uh, uh, having an edge that's fungible to be able to change it into do different types of services, uh, not so much on the demand of a, a, a whim, uh, you know, like I, I want to have compute right this minute and CDN the next, because there's a lot about CDN that doesn't uh, doesn't scale up and down quickly, easily, but the nature of the business is changing and I want to be able to modify the edge of my network uh, uh, in a relatively short period of time is a key element of, I think, what will uh, be working at scale uh, in the future. There are some kind of cultural challenges around around that as well. We um, one of our customers was a uh, satellite operator that was considering uh, becoming a CDN uh, in itself, and they had obviously a sophisticated satellite network, and they also had uh, a very capable um, terrestrial you know fiber network. And uh, we were in discussions with them. We said, okay, well let's let's look at satellite when you need it is an incredibly valuable resource but when it's not being used it's kind of free capacity and so we were saying well let's let's route the traffic from you know, a to b using what currently is the cheapest uh, means of doing so and we went uh, and met with uh, some of their satellite operators and in particular their kind of chosen uh, satellite dish and you know, modem infrastructure and we were saying well how possible is it to to you know, reload and dynamically configure what's what's going up over the satellite and they said oh yeah we've got a couple of customers who do that every week or two and we were saying oh we we were considering doing that several times a second yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and i think that's yeah pretty important point here and we are just touching it but we have not realized that as an industry well as an industry we haven't realized that http is pretty terrible at a lot of things. It's, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> if I shock <laughs> some of you, uh, but yeah, video, for example, is a terrible use case for HTTP. Um, and for caching, WebRTC would be terrible. Mm -hmm. So we've been using HTTP for years because that's an extremely optimized um, protocol now. It's been around for, 20, 30 years. And it was what allowed us to go through firewalls for video, for example. So we just use that. But at some point, we are probably going to reach the limit of that, um, of that technology. And even though we are progressing with HTTP 2, 3, and all that, we are probably going to see uh, holes in those use cases where we should use something else. And so fungibility and the ability to plug into something else is going to be extremely uh, important to just stress that point from Adrian. <laughs> okay, no, a, a different take on this. Right? So if, if, again, if we look, if we decouple infrastructure with functionality, right? So assuming those in the future will be decoupled in some degree. Um, how do you manage QoS along, especially if you look at infrastructures that are whatever, CDN-based, cloud-based, edge-based, MEC-based, and you have different tiers of, of, of uh, capabilities and resources, how would you ever be able to guarantee some sort of QoS on this uh, left or right if it's so diverse? 
How do you manage um, this? It, it's it's a it's a challenge, and it, it it's kind of one that's been around. It sort of came in with the advent of the cloud for me. That that quality of experience, the way you deliver high quality of, of experience, needs to fundamentally change. And as much as in, in a cloud environment, you need to be delivering services that are much more reliable than any one piece of the infrastructure they're running on. And that's, that, that takes a, a you know, I, I used to build you know, banks and things like that for a living. And, and a big system there was, I don't know, six servers with a shared you know, drive or whatever. And a big system now is tens of thousands of servers across you know, 200 data centers doing, you know, which, which in you know, five hours time might be 200 servers because it's, it's scaled up and down. And, um, quality of experience, the one that matters is, is the very end customer. And so typically we would look at what it is that the, as far down the line as close to the customer, what the experience there is uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, can they switch from, from one stream to another? And, and, and if they can, how seamlessly can they do it? And then kind of build backwards from there to how can I make it that if the bad things happen, the customer doesn't notice. I'm thinking of which my alarm's just gone off. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Guillaume, um, well, this, how do you, I mean, you're, you're a, a more closed ecosystem of what you do as, as, as Varnish. Uh, so how do you manage QoS across the board in that regard from a, from a Varnish standpoint? So by staying on, in our lane, basically, um, we, we are transport. I mean, the, the whole thing about uh, VU is layers above us. So the one thing we can do and that we do fairly well is not adding any latency to it. And uh, just making sure that what we are asked is either already in cache or if we need to put it in cache is super quick. Um, so that goes with, well, good code, of course, and, and good design architecture and, and all that. That goes with pre-caching, pre-warming. Um, but at some point, we have to realize that in terms of observability, we only have the information about what's upstream of us. So the next level of caching, the, the origin, etc. So I think the point here uh, that Adrian was uh, trying to make is we need to see what the user is seeing and adjust um, based on that. So and for video, it's also going to be a lot tied with the protocol and what the, what the user is doing. There was a Pretty interesting uh, discussion uh, at DSVA recently regarding simulating um, simulating users, and at the caching level, we cannot really do much. We can make sure that everything's um, flowing, but if the user decides to upscale the bitrate when it doesn't have the bandwidth, there is nothing we can do for it. So it's really it's really an interaction between the platform and the end user. And so we need information at the highest level, basically. I, I completely agree. And I think the fundamental behind that is to measure, 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 and measure. Absolutely. Because, yeah. And, and I, I thought it was really interesting some of the earlier talks today looking at your know, mechanisms for players to, in a standardized way, get you know, characteristics, behavior, and performance measurements back, and so on. Um, but yeah. It, it, it's really an interesting bit of the, the CDN that, that getting the optimal performance on it for so long now has been based on uh, getting feedback from our, our customers because they've got a viewpoint that we just can't have as just the CDN side of it. We just don't know exactly what's happening inside of a player. When a stream stops, we don't know why that stream stopped. We just know that we stopped delivering uh, bits at that moment. If the bandwidth shifts, we don't know why the bandwidth shifted. We just know that uh, a different chunk was called inside of there. So the visibility we get from our customers is, is really a key element of, of the successful tuning of a, a CDN uh, because they have that player side data that is just so precious to us to, to, to know and to optimize. Um, from from the, the uniqueness that is Quilt is uh, the, the one thing that we're doing, I think that's a little bit different, is that we're actually inside of the service provider network and partnership. So we're tuning the spots that we're putting equipment into uh, based on their network architecture and their flows inside the network to try and get an optimal 
uh, delivery. So the service provider uh, is becoming a, a direct partner with us uh, uh, in the, the architecture that we're deploying. And I, I think you're going to see um, as uh, the bits grow in 4 and 8K video that there, there's a, a need for a lot more of that type of uh, infrastructure that's direct, directly tied to the service provider. Because I think just meeting up their borders is going to become more, more and more difficult. I think it's an interesting point, Greg, that you bring in because I know from way back uh, when the whole ICD and stuff from ITF was, was, was happening, one of the questions was SLA. So SLA is in QoS, uh, especially with cascading mechanisms. So I know you guys do the, the open cache stuff. Um, because you can now basically, from a kind of provider to a CDN to an ISP to, uh, to the whole chain, you can actually go back and forth in terms of reporting information back, which normally you would never do. Normally, the CDM would just deliver into an ISP network, traffic, and then they don't know what's happening in the end. Now, with, for instance, open caching, you could say, okay, we can give visibility back on QS, back to uh, the upstream. I think we're at a cusp of change inside the industry. We're just right at the, the event horizon of it. And I think it's gonna be, the, the change is actually not gonna be driven by uh, CDNs, but it's gonna be driven by the largest content uh, providers out there. In, in, in a transparency and visibility and a passing of information and knowledge back and forth about the optimal path to deliver to that user. I think it's gonna be forced by the content providers uh, down on top of people that are doing the content delivery uh, uh, just through their pocketbooks basically. Uh, but mm -hmm. that, that helps improve their quality of experience to have that end-to-end -end visibility uh, uh, that's not always clear right now. And I think we'll see more and more of that uh, and, and more transparency uh, over the next couple of years. That, that oddly enough is actually one of the things kind of built into WebRTC as a, as a protocol. You get a stream of you know, quasi experiences uh, from the player, yeah, technical quasi experiences. I got this many packets, I got this jitter, I got this whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's um, I think increasingly that's just going to become the norm right across everything. One point I wanted to yeah. express on, uh, on Brett's side is that the the observability is super important but also what open caching is bringing is that business understanding that business logic because for years we've been just stashing everything in http because that's that's the king of protocols on the internet but because everything is in http we sort of lose that granularity and that understanding of what's going on so open caching is great because it's re-adding that layer of understanding okay this is video this is how i'm being impacted by the changes i make so it, it's not just about yeah having more metrics it's having the yeah. right one depending on the, the right metric yeah. yeah and the interesting movements like open telemetry and stuff like that for sort of self-describing yeah, metrics okay. and how you can take these metrics from this system over here and correlate them with this other um, you know, system over there so that you get an overall experience, not just this database request took you know, 43 okay. milliseconds or whatever. Yeah. Good. Uh, I see Dom already popping up. So he's like, <laughs> uh, I need to give it back to Dom. Thank you guys so much for the, for the session. And uh, I'll give it back to Dom. Yeah, thanks. That was fun. Thank you. Take care. Awesome session. Like, thank you, Guillaume, Brett, and Mark. And Adrian, I'll have words with you about the alarm later. <laughs> so, I saw some this stuff going on on the tech. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much, guys.